Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emma Reynolds. I'm the Managing Director of Public Affairs Policy and Research at the City UK. I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar on the fundamentals of AI, artificial intelligence. Where, while AI has been evolving for many years, years, these technologies have captured the attention of the world over the last 12 months. The, raise, the rise of AI brings transformative opportunities for our industry and um, harnessing the potential of these technologies is essential to ensuring the long-term competitiveness as the, of the UK as a leading international financial centre. However, as with all technologies, it's vital that we understand and manage the associated risks. With the recent government white paper setting out a pro-innovation approach to AI regulation, and indeed the upcoming government global AI safety summit, now is an opportune moment to discuss these exciting technologies and what they mean for our industry. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our two experts today who are going to speak. Firstly, if they can appear on the screen, that would be fantastic. Firstly, I would like to introduce Professor Philip Trelevan, who will give an overview of what AI is and what the AI landscape will look like now and in the future. Um, Philip has described himself as the oldest AI expert. I wouldn't like to comment, Philip. Uh, and his interest in the subject dates back to when he was at university in the late 1970s. Philip is director of the UK Centre for Financial Computing and Professor of Computing at the University College London. Um, our second speaker today is Manesh Tanna, who will talk us through what AI means for the financial and related professional services industry. Vinesh is a partner at Simmons and Simmons, uh, one of the City UK's uh, members, and he is uh, a partner in their disputes and investigations team, specialising in technology disputes. Um, he is also the firm's global AI lead. Um, so without further ado, Philip, over to you. Thank you. Um, I should say what Emma didn't add was the reason I'm claiming to be the oldest um, AI guy is that I was brought up on a small farm in Cornwall and in farming, AI is artificial insemination. But just for clarity, I'll be talking about the computer side. Um, the, we're in basically an AI revolution that's really been kicked off by chat GTP. And this isn't just an interesting technology. It's it's like going back about 20, 25 years when the IT revolution happened. And it's unimaginable now to think of anybody, uh, you know, for example, coming out of university and going into a company that can't use things like Microsoft Office. And the same thing's happening in AI. If you are a, looking for a career as a professional, and and you and you come out of university and you don't know about these AI tools, uh, you're going to be unemployable. That's as, uh, I always jokingly say. And if you can't ride a bicycle, uh, not even um, Deliveroo will want to touch you. I give you an example. In legal services, you've now got AI, what I call professional productivity tools. Uh, that will generate a, a draft contract for a lawyer. Uh, then the expert lawyer then will go through, note what the um, system is telling them about um, ambiguities and risks, and then we'll uh, finalise the uh, contract. Now, the impact will mean that if a student is expecting to go into a big city law firm and is coming out of university and doesn't know about these tools and how to use them, they could be unemployable. Uh, likewise, it's going to have a big impact on paralegals and trainee solicitors who've traditionally um, uh, you know, generated contracts for, you know, for, the, for the partners. Now, over to uh, just to talk a little bit about my background, we build things. Uh, so I've got a thousand students, 300 PhDs, six or 700 um, master's students and 500 undergraduates. And we, uh, we're a big uh, contributor to financial services. So about 
25 to 30 years ago, we built um, the first insider dealing detection system for the London Stock Exchange. Uh, and um, we also then went on to develop a lot of the early financial fraud detection uh, systems. And um, following that, about 20 years, 18 to 20 years ago, we built the first algorithmic trading platform uh, with Deutsche Bank for fixed income. And then we built a large number of um, platforms with, you know, for Forex uh, and uh, European equities, etc., cetera, with, with other major firms. And um, more recently, uh, we've developed the um, first algorithmic insurance platform uh, with um, Brit Insurance, it's called uh, Kai. So we're always interested in, in what's going to be the next research topic uh, that's going to uh, uh, come along. So if you take, sorry, I'm getting pinged here. If you take what are the students asking to do, you know, the bright ones, firstly, there is a, a large number of them want to go into quantitative trading or you might say fintech. And the the at the moment, there's so many bright people working on quantitative trading uh, that it's almost like a perfect market it's very difficult to identify an algorithm that's going to do, you know, 10 or 15% better than the S&P uh, because it's just been worked over by so many people. So one of the debates at the moment is where is algorithmic trading going to be in the next five or 10 years? Uh, next, you've got decentralized finance. And this is a move away from centralized systems and uh, systems uh, involving cloud computing to web 3.0 peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems where you're turning everything on its head. You've got data sets that stay with the owners and you take the machine learning AI algorithms to the data sets for, uh, uh, for security and privacy. And it's about supporting collaboration. And then the other group of people that are very interested in uh, the financial markets um, is around, obviously, a generative AI, uh, typically equated with chat GTP. And, and here you're training an algorithm to, to be conversational. So you could call it conversational AI. And the sorts of things that the students are building are systems like I described for lawyers, where the system interacts with the client, finds out what investments they're interested in, and then generates a draft portfolio for a fund manager. So these are the major things. So wh what are we going to do? Well, uh, quantitative trading, it's not clear what's going to happen. Uh, uh, decentralized finance is all about blockchain technology uh, and uh, what are called federated learning. Uh, conversational AI, the hot topic at the moment, is finding different uh, ways to actually create algorithmic uh, platforms. Now, the interesting thing is that a lot of companies in the UK are basically in denial. Uh, one example being uh, the insurance industry, where uh, you've got companies like in China, like Ping An, who are using things like blockchain technology to automate insurance uh, and using things like smart contracts. And, and, it, and the British companies are just making good profits. So why change? So where do you look for what's going to happen? We Well, the sort of projects we look at, we've got a very interesting project, as I said, in conversational AI, which are tools for fund to support fund managers. We've also got an interesting algorithmic sports betting uh, platform. So just to drill down. What when you talk about AI, you also need to talk about emerging technologies because it's not just artificial intelligence. It's about all sorts of algorithms uh, like computational statistics. You've got uh, user interfaces and environments uh, like natural language understanding and chatbots. Uh, 
uh, and uh, also all the sort of virtual reality environments. And as I said, there's a move away from centralized cloud computing, which is basically a hosting technology, to what we're calling federated computing, where you're working with distributed data sets to support um, the collaboration. Um, so let's move down. So it's a basket full of technologies that you need to be aware of for the future. And it's not just to make sure your company is developing new products, but you, if you're not using these technologies uh, for uh, for your job, you don't know what tools are around, uh, you're not going to be future-proofing your career. So there's an, and it's an absolute tsunami of these things at, at the moment. So what I'm going to do now is to drill down with algorithms. So although machine learning algorithms, which I'll talk about, and particularly generative AI, have, get all of the uh, uh, publicity, there's actually three areas of algorithms. The first is computational statistics, which is comp comp uh, computationally intensive statistical methods, uh, then like Monte Carlo, then there are complex systems, uh, which uh, are large numbers of interacting components. And here you've got agent based systems. And then finally, you've got artificial intelligence. And even with artificial intelligence, you can break it down into uh, rule based systems. And these have been around probably for 20 or 30 years. And they're the sort of thing that drives um, uh, uh, call centers who are, you know, offering loans or uh, mortgages, etc. Then you've got evolutionary algorithms like uh, genetic algorithms, which are sort of optimization techniques. And then what is normally equated with artificial intelligence is machine learning that have the ability to learn by having by consuming huge amounts of data uh, without any explicit programming. So now we're going to drill down on machine learning. Now, the first is for the last, I don't know, 20 years or 30 years, we've had traditional machine learning. These are AI models that identify patterns within a training data set and make predictions. Next, you've got, you know, the new kid on the block, generative AI, as exemplified by uh, ChatGTP. Uh, and these can dynamically create conversational human-like texts, images, speech, video, even write programs for you, uh, etc. Et, et and the future uh, is what is called algorithmic superintelligent, where you have algorithms that uh, evolve, uh, can solve problems uh, better than people. And you talk, we talk about these, oh, it's going to be eight or 10 years before these algorithms uh, can, you know, can really do incredible things. But every week goes by uh, and you read something in the mainstream newspapers about some really clever algorithm performing better than, you know, a, a medical consultant or such like not so easy to see what they can the these super intelligent algorithms might do uh, in uh, in finance but clearly it's a technology that you need to uh, um uh, to monitor and probably the most what you might call frightening area is the use of actually deep fakes by you know cyber criminals which is a good example of where the technology is going now, drilling down a little further on generative AI, you've got what are called large language models. Uh, and these are um, models trained on vast quantities of data to produce human-like responses to dialogues uh, or other natural language inputs. And when you're talking about vast quantities of data, many of the things like ChatGTP are trained on uh, trillions of data points, not millions, trillions. And the the sort of ramifications of this, that a lot of these models are actually trained illegally 
are by just consuming people's data on the web. So there's a lot of sort of spin-off uh, things. The next term you will see or you'll hear is generative pre-trained transformers, GPT, GPT, that dynamically create. Uh, so these are the models that underlie, or these are the, yes, these are the, G, the models that underlie large language models uh, that create this human-like content. Uh, um, content, but without any concern at the moment for accuracy. And one of the fascinating things about uh, large language models and GTP is they can hallucinate. And that is you ask them a question and you get back a load of rubbish. Uh, and uh, the the therefore it's very important for what we call having the human in the loop, because the human can then go through all the data that's produced uh, and actually extract the um, what is correct and what is clearly an hallucination. And the nice thing about these models, which I personally find fascinating, is that if you tell it, no, this is a load of bollocks, you know, you need to, uh, uh, this isn't correct, it'll then hallucinate even more and try and convince you that, that it is correct. So interesting concept. Um, now, just to talk about some of these technologies that you'll uh, hear about, deep learning. Um, these are a type of so-called uh, artificial neural network models where you've got multiple layers of processing. So it's a very complex network of um, artificial neurons that process data. The next is uh, transformers. And these are a type of deep learning that underpin all this generative AI. Uh, and uh, they're used particularly for natural language processing, which could be text, images, speech, etc. And uh, just to give you an example about these transformers, um, it's now possible to record just three seconds of your voice pattern and you can replicate exactly what a person's saying. And then finally, uh, the there is what's called federated learning. And in the past, you've taken data into the um, uh, into the cloud uh, to collaborate, uh, but it's very uh, risky. And what's happened now is you keep the data personal to the owner and you actually take the algorithm to the data. And this was originally developed by um, Google to actually learn uh, keystroke patterns on mobile phones, where clearly people didn't want to transfer all their mobile data to uh, Google. Excuse me. Um, I'm just about to finish because I think I'm running out of time. I would just like to um, say that the biggest problem that we're going to face in financial services is cybercrime, excuse me. Uh, the, in the past, the, the thing we don't talk about is that um, the internet has been driven by adult entertainment, streaming, online payments, etc. And now you've got cybercrime, uh, which is um, generating unbelievably huge profits in the you know, billions for cyber criminals. And you've got all this AI deep fake technology. Uh, therefore, it's, uh, it's, it's going to take um, crime to a whole new level. So I've run out of time. So I'll pass back to Emma now. Thank Thanks you. so much, Philip, for that fantastic overview, including at the end, um, some of the risks involved too. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Manesh from Simmons & Simmons to take us through what artificial intelligence means for our industry. Manesh, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. And thank you to the City UK for organising this webinar. <clears throat> and thank you for Philip, to Philip for his introductory remarks. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to cover three topics. First, why AI causes risks and what are some of those risks? Second, what the current legal, regulatory and ethical landscape looks like for AI, particularly for the FRPS industry. And third, how we can mitigate those risks from a practical perspective. I just want to start with some theme setting 
And to do that, I'll take you back to March 2016. DeepMind created an AI-powered version of the board game Go called AlphaGo. And AlphaGo challenged the then world champion Lee Sedol to a series of games of Go. And in game two, move 37, AlphaGo made a move that shocked all of the people in the room. They thought it was a wrong move, a basic move. They were surprised. It turns out many moves later that that was the winning move. And that goes to show, I think, and this really resonates with me, that not only are we dealing with an impressive form of technology that's able to learn how to play games and challenge world champions, but actually we're dealing with a different form of technology that reasons in a different way to humans. It does things outside of our comprehension. And that, for me, is one of the biggest issues which drives a lot of the risks I'll talk about. So turning now to that first topic, risks that we see from AI. So the first point to say is that uh, we are dealing with a no novel form of technology that's not easy to understand. And that complexity leads to what we call opacity. You've probably heard of the black box issue. What that essentially refers to is our inability as humans to always understand how an AI system arrives at a decision or output. And that has knock-on consequences. It's difficult to trace how an AI system arrives at a decision. It's difficult to predict how the AI system is going to deal with new scenarios, new data that it encounters in real life situations. So if you take, for example, an AI system used to score a candidate's CV in the recruitment process, if we're unable to explain why the AI system has scored that CV in the way it has, I'm sure you'll agree that that could present a problem. Equally, when it comes to things like autonomous vehicles, the less we're able to predict how they're going to behave, the more risks they present. The third risk is related to this, which is autonomy. And as Philip mentioned, we have been dealing with rule-based systems for a long time in the world of computing. That's where computers follow human-made rules and they arrive at an outcome based on those rules. We often call those deterministic systems. They have to act within the rules set by humans. With AI, what we're seeing is more of a move from automation to autonomy probabilistic systems, as we call them, systems that make predictions. And autonomy is one of the key features that's been picked up, for example, in the UK white paper as being a key feature of AI. And it was also noted by the FCA Bank of England, the PRA discussion paper on AI last year. It's a key feature, but a key risk of AI. And the final risk just to pick up on, and again, building on something that Philip mentioned, is data. AI systems process large volumes of data when they're being deployed on a day-to-day -day basis. They're also typically trained on data sets. And in the case of, for example, large language models that are used to power generative AI, those data sets can be significant. Philip referred to trillions of data points, and that's absolutely right. So the key features of AI that create these risks, complexity and opacity, autonomy and data. So let's look now at what risks that presents for us, particularly in this industry. Hopefully, it starts to become clear when you understand those key features of AI. Let's start with data privacy, which, as I'm sure any of you who've been involved with GDPR um, have been aware of the issues that this has caused over the last few years. There is inevitably lots of personal data used in the training and deployment of AI systems. That gives rise to core GDPR issues around the lawful basis for processing that data, data retention, and there is, as you would expect, instances where special category data is used, as it's referred to in the GDPR. So, for example, biometric data, which may be used for facial recognition systems. We have also seen actions taken by data privacy authorities, which lend themselves to other principles under the GDPR, which are being used to enforce against AI, transparency, fairness, and accuracy. And I think some of these are key in the FRPS industry, where organizations are likely to be using consumer data, even employee data. And so I think we're likely to see an increase in data privacy risks out of the use of AI in this industry. IP, 
That's already becoming a significant issue with AI. The main area that you've probably seen in some fairly high profile cases that have been launched is copyright in training data sets. So where, for example, a large language model is being trained on huge volumes of data, as we've mentioned, some of that data may well be subject to copyright. And it may be an infringement to use that data to train large AI models. Now, the interesting thing with IP is that the position will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In the US, for example, there is a fair use doctrine, and that's going to be tested in quite a few cases. Does it count as fair use to be able to use copyrighted data in the training of AI models that are arguably giving lots of benefit to society? In the UK, there was some discussion for a while as to whether there should be an exemption for text and data mining for commercial use of data. I think the current position is that that exemption is not going to be available, so the position might be less, um, more restrictive in the UK. Now, the issue of autonomy that I mentioned gives rise to a number of issues. It effectively means that AI can be unpredictable, as I mentioned. Now, in the FRPS industry, you can imagine some key risks that this feature of AI creates. AI might be used in financial products to assist audits, to undertake legal work. Really, where there's any sort of decision, particularly one that could impact consumers, there is a risk by using AI that it goes wrong. And that issue is compounded by this lack of transparency that we have. We're perhaps in this industry not talking about physical harm that could result from AI going wrong, but certainly there's the prospect of financial harm and actually other intangible forms of harm, for example, discrimination. Now, we've mentioned generative AI, and it's perhaps heresy to have an AI talk these days without mentioning generative AI and chat GPT. I just want to focus for a moment on some of the risks that generative AI in particular creates. And I think really what it does is heighten some of the existing risks that I've mentioned with AI generally. The first is this issue of autonomy and unpredictability. What we're seeing with generative AI, particularly large language models, is this issue of hallucination. The ability of conversational LLMs to actually generate false information. There was quite an interesting case in the States that you might have heard of in the case of Avianca and Matta, where a lawyer relied on generative AI to draft legal submissions and relied on the generative AI system to give it cases that supported the submissions. Now, it turned out that the cases that were provided were entirely fictitious. The court picked up on this, and that lawyer is now facing potential sanctions for relying on those fictitious cases. The data privacy and IP issues are particularly acute with generative AI for the simple fact that, as we've mentioned, these models tend to rely on huge volumes of data. So you're effectively exacerbating this risk. There is potential for privacy infringement and IP infringement at a large scale. And then just a practical point about why generative AI really heightens some of the existing risks, which is its widespread use and adoption. We are seeing generative AI in many different industries, particularly in the FRPS industry, where also it could be consumer facing, and that in itself creates risk as well. So a number of risks um, that arise from AI and generative AI. Let's now turn to the legal regulatory and ethical landscape. How regulators and courts respond to these risks. I'll start with ethical AI. Now, for a number of years, there's been a concept that you may have heard of, of responsible or ethical AI. Using AI appropriately is effectively what the concept captures. And we've had lots of frameworks over quite a few years that cover this topic, so much so that we now have a good idea of a set of principles that we think the concept of responsible or ethical AI embodies. Those are concepts like human oversight, fairness, transparency, accountability, accuracy, and security. And I agree with Philip's view that cybersecurity is going to be uh, an increasingly sensitive issue when it comes to AI. What we're seeing now is law and regulation starting to overtake 
concepts of responsible or ethical AI, or at least the convergence between those two areas. Now, responsible AI has played an important role. A lot of organizations have used that concept to develop their own responsible AI principles. And those principles are starting to help shape regulation. Now, when I started out on this AI journey a few years ago, there was a lot of attention about what AI regulation would look like. But a few things to say about that, because Here in 2023, despite having um, used AI for a number of years and having had generative AI in our lives for um, the last year or so in a big way, we still don't see that much AI-specific regulation across the world. And I think there are a few reasons for that. It's a slow process to regulate AI. It's not an easy thing to do. We're seeing that at the moment with the EU AI Act, which I think is going to be a game-changing piece of regulation, but that was first introduced in April 2021. So we're almost two and a half years later and we still don't have a final text. It's not easy. And part of the reason it's not easy is because one has to decide whether you want to regulate the outcomes. For example, are you seeking to prohibit discrimination caused by AI? Are you seeking to regulate the uses of AI? For example, we don't want people using AI in the areas of Um, recruitment or HR without sufficient control, for example, or are you actually regulating the technology itself? We want foundation models to be developed in a particular way. And that's one of the issues that the EU is grappling with at the moment, and one of the reasons why it's taking a while for the EU AI Act to be introduced. So what we're seeing at the moment to cover that gap is regulators use existing tools that they have in their armory to enforce against AI. And three of those are data privacy, consumer law, and competition law. And you've probably seen data privacy authorities already enforcing against AI. I think the most high-profile instance was the Italian Data Protection Authority suspending the use of ChatGPT in Italy due to alleged violations of the GDPR. But we're also now increasingly seeing consumer regulators pick up on AI, And also competition law regulators starting to investigate whether or not there are competition law issues created through AI. But the landscape, I think, in a few years is going to be one of these existing regulations used to enforce against AI, but a whole new world of AI regulation that's going to emerge from various jurisdictions. As I say, the EU is going to be one of those um, high profile instances. And in my view, the EU AI Act is going to become a gold standard for AI regulation in a similar way to the GDPR. So it's going to be a heavily regulated landscape, and we're again going to see other issues around regulation, for example, IP, which is less of a regulatory issue, but nevertheless an important legal issue. And as I say, we're already seeing legal action, particularly class actions in that area. And then we're also going to see legal action for instances where AI goes wrong and causes intangible harm. And that could be a particular risk in the FRPS industry. Let's say, for example, that a large bank is using AI in its recruitment processes, and it turns out after a number of months that that AI system is causing discrimination. You can imagine at that point, a number of people lining up to potentially take legal action against the bank, and that's leaving aside the regulatory angle. So in the final minute or two, I'm just going to wrap up by talking about how organizations should mitigate these risks from AI. We're talking a lot at the moment, and I'm advising on the concept of AI governance. Quite a nebulous concept, but really what it means is getting to grips with AI, ensuring that your organization is dealing with AI in the right way in order to deal with and mitigate the risks that I've been discussing. Now, this is a complex exercise. It's multifaceted. It needs senior buy-in and it's cross-discipline, particularly in the FRPS industry, where there's likely to be existing governance processes, particularly for areas like data privacy. There are existing risk and compliance structures, probably a three lines of defense model. Where I think we're seeing um, the most activity is implementing governance framework to deal with AI. And briefly, we see four stages. The first is understanding how the organization is using AI. So if your organization hasn't yet got, for example, an inventory of all of its AI use, that's something worth starting with. The second is risk assessment. Looking at your use cases or models in the organization, 
and working out how risky they, risky they are. That could be by reference to, for example, the type of data they use. Are any of them using biometric data, which is obviously more sensitive? Are they operating in a black box because they use particularly complex algorithms? Are they consumer facing? You also then look at the regulatory side. Are any of our AI use cases or models impacted by, for example, the GDPR? Might they be classified as high risk under the forthcoming EU AI Act? The third stage in that process is then implementing compliance measures. You've worked out where the risks lie for your organization. You then need to implement compliance measures to ensure that you reduce those risks. Now, AI regulation will be quite prescriptive in the future about what these measures should involve. And it's worth looking, for example, at the EU AI Act for examples of what measures should be put in place. And then finally, what governance structures you should have in place to oversee this process and also to monitor AI. We're dealing with a fast moving area. The technology is moving quickly and regulation and legal issues are moving quickly. It's vital that you have in place those processes and structures now to be able to keep on top of this. Because one thing for sure, AI is not going anywhere. We may be going through a mini hype cycle with generative AI, but AI is here to stay. It's going to be transformative and it's going to have a huge impact on this industry. And so AI governance is really about putting in place processes and structures to deal with the risks that this technology presents so that we can safely harness the opportunities that it presents. I hope that was a helpful summary. Um, I'll now hand back to Emma. Hugely helpful. Thanks so much, uh, Minesh. I've got, I've got a couple of questions for our experts today, but I wanted to encourage everybody who's attending this webinar to put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, Minesh, a quick question to you, but just because the very last thing that you said prompted a thought, um, uh, and, and which is actually a reflection of a conversation that I had with one of the City UK's members. And it, it's this, that obviously there is concern about the risks uh, of AI for our industry, and you've outlined a lot of those um, in, in a very clear way. Is there a risk, however, that our regulators or regulators in other countries um, try to regulate to such an extent the use of AI that they overdo uh, the regulation and then stifle innovation? Do you think that it might be a risk? Yes, in a, in a word, there is a risk. I, I remember when the EU AI Act was first introduced, and I, I know I keep referring to that, but it's, uh, I think, as I say, a game-changing piece of, of regulation. When it was first introduced in April 2021, the immediate reaction from a lot of us in the community was that it was perhaps overly burdensome and therefore likely to stifle innovation. I do think the landscape has moved on since then, though. I think there's a, a wider recognition of the risks that AI creates and the need to be able to protect consumers in particular. There's also a question of trust. And I often use the analogy of airplanes. I fly airplanes all the time. I have no idea how they stay up in the air, but I trust them. And I think that's for two reasons. First, they've got a track record of safety. I know planes have flown for years safely. The second is they're regulated. I know the pilot has been trained. I know the plane has had to meet safety standards. Well, with AI, we have neither of those things really. So how are we going to build trust with AI? And I think the answer to that is regulation. So even if there is a small risk of stifling innovation in the short term, ultimately regulation is helpful to protect against the risks that we know AI is capable of causing and to harness and foster trust in AI so that we can actually exploit its opportunities and benefits in the long run. I'll come to yeah. that in a minute, but yeah, I, just, yeah please I... come in on that. And I just want to, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, um, if you go, if you if you're going to encourage innovation, you need to live a little dangerously. Uh, and I'd like to point out that the American uh, big tech companies thrived because America didn't have any data protection laws. So we have a saying is that America innovates and then uh, doesn't regulate. China innovates and then regulates. And Europe regulates and then doesn't innovate. Yeah. 
And I, I, I personally think that Europe will probably screw up and everybody, will, all the startups will move to the United States. Really, the only benefit of uh, of European legislation is people like Minesh who make a lot of money <laughs> out of, you know, all the all the cases. But uh, it, it China wants to be dominant in AI. American wants to be dominant. Uh, you can't regulate until you really understand where the problems are. Now, I remember years ago with algorithmic trading, we used to do unbelievably illegal things. You know, uh, we used to do, uh, you know, front running, ramping, pinging people's um, uh, algorithms, uh, you know, all, all sorts of things. Uh, but And luckily we managed to get away with it, you know, and, and behaved ourselves. Uh, but the problem is that when we had discussions about uh, we needed a new set of laws for um, trading algorithms, uh, I was the one who ar argued that mar market manipulation laws, you know, were already in place and it didn't matter whether it was a human or an algorithm. And in the end, there was very little, law, you know, legal changes brought in. So I think that probably Europe will screw up and, uh, you know, will kill off. Uh, any sort of algorithm uh, innovation and we'll do what our student startups do you know as immediately they get some traction they move to move to the us all right that well, was, let, let yeah. me be interesting for Manesh to come back on that the other thing that a member of um uh, said to me Manesh about the europe european uh, regulation is that because this is such a fast moving technology it could be, become out of date relatively quickly. So, could you deal with Philip's point and and that potential argument too about because obviously you've, I'm sure it's not as cynical as Philip would have us believe, but you're very positive about the European AI regulation. But there's clearly a big difference between the two of you in the way that you see it. And I'm sure it's not just to do with money, Philip. But <laughs> with you, um, two points to come back on Philip's um, point. The US does still have AI regulation. There isn't much AI regulation around the world, but the jurisdiction with the most number of AI laws in the world is the US. There are a number of state level AI regulations. So the US isn't going to be a free for all light touch regulatory regime. There are still going to be AI laws. So I'm not sure it holds through um, that, that everyone's going to flock to the US. I mean, there are other reasons why it's an attractive jurisdiction for innovation, but I'm not sure it being a free of regulation is going to be one of them. Um, the other point is we're already regulating against AI. Data privacy authorities, consumer authorities, and competition law authorities are already seeking to regulate AI. And the question is, do you let them do that with their existing tools, which sort of work, but are not finally curated for the purposes of enforcing against AI, or do you actually bring in proper AI regulation and do this properly? And, and I think the latter is a better approach and probably in the long run is going to better foster innovation. In terms of AI regulation becoming out of date, that's a really good point. And it comes back to that distinction I made between how you target AI regulation. If you regulate the technology itself, and you try and regulate, for example, as the EU is trying to do most recently, foundation models and generative AI, there is a risk. We're already seeing terminology change. At the UK forthcoming safety summit, they're referring to frontier AI models and less foundation models. And so there is a risk that if you target technology as your basis for regulation, that things could become out of date. What the EU is mainly trying to do is target uses. And that's probably not going to become out of date. So, for example, high risk uses are identified in the EU AI Act, which attract a greater level of obligations. Things like use in law enforcement, in border control, in recruitment, in critical infrastructure, that sort of stuff. Brilliant. Thanks so much. And we have our first question from our audience. And I would encourage others, please, to put your questions in the Q&A. Please don't wait for 10 minutes to warm up because then we will be wrapping up at two. So um, very grateful to our chief economist, uh, Angelica Bardolai, for putting this in the chat. Um, I'd be interested, she says, to hear a view on synthetic data being used to train AI, AI models. Is this common within financial and professional services? Will it become more common? And does it change any of the risks that were discussed? 
maybe it mitigates some of them perhaps, or maybe it introduces new ones. You want me to start? Um, Go ahead, over to you, Philip. We normally, yeah. we normally use uh, synthetic data when we haven't got access to real data. Uh, but, uh, you know, recently Tesco said they were going to sell their club card data to their suppliers so you can see what's happening. Um, we, we, we are doing a lot of work on trying to make data an asset, you know, that, that you can control and also monetize. And um, as I said, we, we the biggest problem with any sort of data science is access to real data. Uh, companies are obviously... Sorry to ask you this, because this is supposed to be a kind of very basic educational session. Yeah. Just tell us again, what this, how do you define synthetic data? Sorry if you did it earlier. Let, just... let's, let's take a simple one. If, you, if, you, if you've got, let's say you need a customer data set to train your model on, uh, and no one is prepared to um, give you that data or collaborate with you or sell it to you, et cetera. So what you've got to do is to take synthetic data which is you make up the customer data to try and use that to train models but uh, it doesn't work very well um, and uh, you know what you what you really need is the trillions of data and and the challenge is to actually make that data legal uh, so that the owner is actually recompensed for the value of that data did that answer your question Emma? Yes, I think I think so. Um, and did we answer Angelica's question more more to the point? The risks involved. Shall, shall I maybe address that? Yeah, briefly, that'd be great. Emma? Thanks. Um, I think we are going to see, I think, more synthetic data sets. I mean, interesting when you think about large language models. Um, a lot of those were trained on basically the entirety of the web, um, and there is a genuine concern about running out of data on which to train these models. So I think we will see more of it. It, it probably will mitigate the risks around data privacy and potentially also IP as well, because it should reduce the risk of training data, training models on data sets containing copyrighted information, and you shouldn't be processing personal data for, for that purpose as well. But there are definitely likely to be new risks, and I think they'll probably come from things like representativeness of the synthetic data. Is it going to actually train the model in a way that it won't have discrimination or bias built into it? How can you control that with synthetic data? And also accuracy. How are you sure that the, um, the data you're using is going to result in accurate outputs? Can I just add, I don't think you need any new laws, uh, for, you know, for you know, data protection and privacy and things like that, uh, because it, it's, it, you know, it, it's copyright information and that and the existing laws cover it. And maybe it's controversial, but I don't think GDPR has really added much to life apart from bureaucracy. Oh, well, I'd be interested in Manessa's view on that one. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, look, I, I, I can understand why it does feel lack of bureaucratic process to deal with the GDPR. But I think there, there are lots of actions around Europe, which I think at their heart are, are seeking to protect privacy rights. And I think what it's done is certainly increased awareness and scrutiny of privacy rights and ensuring that organizations are thinking about that. So yes, there may be a lot of bureaucracy, but I think it's probably achieved what it set out to achieve, probably more so than than it than it sought out to achieve in some ways. Okay, can I just move the argument on um, to perhaps another ethical dimension of AI, which is people's jobs and people being concerned that uh, by using more AI, we're going to start replacing people's jobs and what that might mean in our industry, in other industries, in the level of employment in different countries. Um, and will it also change the skills that are needed in our industry uh, going forward? Manesh, do you want to start on that one? Sure, I'll, I'll take your second point first. It's definitely going to change the set of skills that um, graduates, employees are going to need generally. I think Philip mentioned earlier that um, if you come out of university not knowing about these tools, you're going to be at a disadvantaged position in the job market. I think that's right. And we're already, for example, in the legal industry, talking about lawyers being trained with prompt engineering. And that's the area of, of uh, where, where you 
input prompts into generative AI systems, the better your prompt, the better the output. And it's quite a skill to put in the right prompt to get the right output. So that area is already a skill that we're saying lawyers should have, for example, if they're going to be using generative AI. On job displacement, I mean, there's lots of noise about, well, AI is going to create jobs, and, and that's right. But ultimately, for this industry in particular, where it's very service heavy, it's very there's a lot of human involvement in the delivery of services, there is going to be job displacement, and, and I'm concerned about that. I think at the junior end of things is probably where um, jobs are going to be more vulnerable. Take junior lawyers, for example, who probably do a lot of reviewing documents, legal research, analysis. All of that is probably going to be significantly impacted by AI, particularly generative AI. And I think my key concern is where's the next generation of senior leaders and senior members of organizations going to come from yep. if AI is displacing those at the junior end of the, the scale? Can I, the, uh, the the key thing for all the people on the call is how you're going to future-proof your career. Uh, and uh, that's why awareness is the great thing. And you just have to start, you know, there's amazing material online. Uh, interestingly, the big drive for AI education is actually coming from the high schools. So, you know, the, the, the enlightened teachers and schools are really pushing to use AI to generate educational material and also encouraging their high school students, you know, to learn to program and learn to use these uh, you know, to get involved with machine learning. At the other end of the the, the, the stream, if we take the professional end, uh, there's companies like uh, Minesh, it's clearly, you know, um, very clued up on where AI is going. I've been trying over the years to get our famous laws faculty at UCL to embrace law tech. And you you know, you, the, I don't know whether they're worried that computer science is going to eat their lunch, but they certainly have managed to avoid it <laughs> so, uh, so far. And uh, uh, there was one about eight years ago when I gave a talk on law tech to the great and the good in the law faculty. And I said, without you know, engaging my brain, oh, we're going to make systems that will remove ambiguity from legal contracts. And to a person, they all leapt to their feet. Don't do that. That's where we make our money. <laughs> so, you know, it's it, it will have a big impact. But getting, you know, edu you know, a successful, uh, particularly educational establishments to equip their students with this technology is an uphill battle. I think you think that in boardrooms, um, they just, these discussions about AI and job displacement and both the risks and the opportunities. Do you think that these discussions are going on at the top of companies yet? The Certainly with enlightened companies, and I'll give you an example, Tesco's is, um, is well aware and has asked for briefings on emerging technologies, you know, for the board and for the company wide and they've and they're getting into you know th things like selling their data and and that and, the, and they're very clued up and then there's other companies mm -hmm. like the insurance industry uh that, that you know you think they're still grappling with embracing it not not not, not ai and you know they're 20 years behind the investment banks in in terms of automation so um it's very patchy you know the successful companies will thrive and others are going to be left fielded by you know competitors um the other interesting thing just to mention uh, some of my students are actually setting up startups and selling them for large sums of money like two of my students sold a company uh, to uh, sold their company to a large american company for 26 million dollars and and one of my um, ex PhD still students recently sold his latest company for one point two billion. So the opportunities are amazing, uh, and that's why people need to be aware, you know, not just for their own careers and companies, but also the opportunities to, you know, do startups and such like. Minas. Yeah, I fully agree on, on the opportunities. And I think that's probably the focus of the discussions at board level, because I think what ChatGPT's done is 
show everyone on a mass scale what AI is capable of doing. I think we all in the AI community knew what it was capable of doing. We've had generative AI for years, but this has kind of brought it to the mainstream. And now we're starting to see the use cases flow from that. So I think what's happening at a board level is leaders thinking we need to get on board with this. We need to to join the get get on the AI journey and make sure that we're harnessing the benefits it can bring, particularly from a productivity and cost perspective, right? Which is obviously always on on the radar of board members. What we're now starting to see is, I think, more discussions around well, how do we do this properly, responsibly, in a regulatory compliant way, particularly in this industry, um, which is used to having regulation, particularly the financial services industry, and so banks are naturally thinking and wary about the regulatory side of it as well. So we're starting to see more conversations at a board level about how to adopt AI, but to do it in a safe and responsible way. Right. Quick fire last question. The UK likes to think it's a global leader in lots of different things. Uh, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Does the UK have an opportunity here to become a, a global leader in this technology? Philip? Yes. And, and how? But they've also got the opportunity to screw it up. And uh, I, 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 I think I'd be interested to see how it pans out. But if they bring in some GDPR-like legislation for algorithms and... Uh, you know, I, I I would be surprised if China and the United States follow suit. And therefore, they would be the leaders or maybe yeah. already are. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've got a great potential. We're really good at uh, innovation and startups. But, um, for example, most of my student startups, and we spin out a huge number, move to the United States. Um, I, I'm sure Manesh would you know, say that's because of the market size, but, um, you know, it, it's also a lot easier to do innovation and business there. And um, I, I I think that we, we're in danger. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a watch this space, but uh, I think we've got a, a danger of actually screwing it up, to use the euphemism. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. Minesh, quickly over to you. What are your thoughts? Yes, huge opportunity for the UK. I think what we have that distinguishes us from other jurisdictions is just a wealth of human talent. Um, we're an incredibly talented jurisdiction, and that can go a long way with AI. And I think coming at it from the kind of regulatory perspective, I don't think the UK is going to have such a blunt regulatory instrument like the EU AI Act. It's going to be a more carefully curated approach, one that could actually um inspire other jurisdictions for example we might start to think about certification and standards rather than binding hardcore regulation and so we'll find a carefully curated way of dealing with ai safely safety is the theme of the forthcoming summit and i think that could make us a world leader in finding the right approach to using ai safely brilliant well on that note what an optimistic note we end on uh, that has been hugely helpful. I want to say a thank you on behalf of all of the City, City UK's members who have watched this session, um, attended it. A big thank you to Philip, a big thank you to Minesh. I'm sure this won't be the last time we meet to discuss these issues. I sense that the interest in AI, AI will continue uh, to grow and I think there's real uh, industry interest in how we can harness the potential whilst both mitigating the risks and seeing if we could develop a capacity to become a global leader in AI. Many thanks to both of you and thanks to all for attending. Thank you.